Hey, everyone, and welcome to the All It Takes is a Goal podcast, the best place in the entire world, including all of Canada, to learn how to build new thoughts, new actions, and new results. I'm your host, John Acuff, and today I'm joined by Carrie Newhoff. Who's that? Well, I'm, I'm very glad you asked. Carrie Newhoff is a best-selling leadership author, speaker, podcaster, and former attorney. He hosts one of today's most influential leadership podcasts. His podcast, blog, and online content are viewed more than 1.5 million times every month. He speaks to leaders around the world about leadership, change, and personal growth. Carrie and his wife, Tony, live north of Toronto, and he's my friend. We've spent the last eight years or so touring together and speaking at events. I've had so many conversations in green rooms with him about life, about leadership, about writing books, about doing podcasts. And it's so fun to interview one of my mentors. I call Kerry once a month to bounce ideas off him. So he's somebody that I really look up to. He's somebody I really respect. And he's got a brand new book coming out. It's called At Your Best, How to Get Time, Energy, and Priorities Working in Your Favor. And he said something in today's conversation that knocked a lot of my excuses um, when it comes to goals right over. I was trying to stump him a bit about how I spend my time and, well, what if I can't control this portion of my time? And he he just flat out crane kicked me, which is a little bit of a Karate Kid reference for you. But yeah, he got me. It was so good, so helpful. I can't wait for you to hear this one. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Remodel Health. Navigating health benefits can be a struggle, especially for leaders who wear so many different hats within their organization. Luckily, you don't have to stress about picking the perfect plan for your team. Thanks to Remodel Health, you can get tailored health benefits that fit your organization's needs. Their in-depth, personalized approach to health benefits allows you to discover more options, serve employees better, and control the cost and quality of your health benefits like never before. What's more, Remodel customers save an average of 56% on health benefits. Imagine what you could do with savings like that. With their dedicated team of compassionate healthcare experts and consultants, your organization can experience better benefits while still getting the hands-on individual care your people need. Are you ready to learn how Remodel Health could help your organization provide better benefits and find bigger savings? Remodel's benefits consultants can run a health benefits analysis on your unique team to evaluate your current plan and help you find a better alternative that saves you money and better meets the needs of your people. Head over to remodelhealth.com slash analysis today to learn more about the health benefits analysis and get your personalized evaluation. Let me spell that one because the word analysis can be tricky. I've never once spelled the word occasionally correct. So fortunately, it's not the word occasionally, but that that word can be tricky. It's remodelhealth.com slash A-N-A-L-Y-S-I-S. Remodelhealth.com slash analysis. Experience better benefits and bigger savings with Remodel Health. All right, let's jump into the interview. Here I am talking with my friend, Carrie Newhoff. All right, Carrie Newhoff. Thank you so much for joining me. I was really looking forward to this conversation and I'm glad it's already here. John, I love our conversations. Honor to be with you today on your show. And I'm excited because you've got a brand new book that before we even hit record, I was telling you, please, 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 I need a real copy of this one. I have a PDF. Um, I love this book. I want to mark up the pages because there's going to be a lot of ink, a lot of highlights. Um, the title of the book is At Your Best, How to Get Time, Energy, and Priorities Working in Your Favor. One of the questions that I always enjoy when somebody asks me about a book is, why this book? Why this topic? Why right now? Well, the opposite of this book almost killed me, John. So mm-hmm. uh, I feel like my life's on a hinge. And I think if you reach a certain age, you look back and you're like, oh, yeah, this was before that moment. And then after that moment, like think about you when you went out on your own, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. your life's kind of on a hinge or when you left the corporate world to pursue a dream. And my hinge for me, unfortunately, was uh, I got hit by a truck. I burned out 15 years ago in 2006. And if you look at it, it was really 
not predictable, at least in my head. I think other people predicted it, but uh, I was a lawyer first and then went into ministry, led a very fast growing church. We were one of the largest in the country, uh, fastest growing in our denomination, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, anybody who's led a growing thing from a growing company, Mm -hmm. growing startup, growing family, it doesn't matter what it is. If you've led growth, I had a terrible formula and that was more people equaled more hours. And if you had stopped me in April of 2006 and said, Carrie, how you doing? I'd be like, top of the world, John. Like, things could not be better. Spoke at a national conference in Atlanta, 2,500 people in the room, biggest crowd I've ever spoken to. Flew back to Toronto. And when I got off the plane, it's like all the air went out of the balloon. Passionate, driven guy lost my passion, lost my drive. And I thought, oh, I got this because I'm like a control freak. I got this. That's okay. I'm going to go to bed. I'll wake up in the morning. I'll be fine. And it's like I fell off a cliff and there were no branches. There was nothing to hang on to. And I burned out and it, it went through about four months of just complete burnout, went to work every day, but the passion was gone. I could go through the motions. I had brain fog like you wouldn't believe. I got to a functioning point like reasonable within four or five months, but it took three to five years for me to get back to normal. And in there, I'm like, I can't go back to normal, normal because it killed me. So I need to figure out a new way of operating. And so counseling, coaching, and then I found this new system, trial and error. And suddenly I was way more effective, way more productive to the point where a few years ago, number one question people ask me is, dude, how do you get it all done? Like you you launch a podcast, you're writing a blog, millions of leaders have shown up, you're leading something, you got a growing team and you have time left over. And then I realized, I wonder if this works for other people. And so now I have a book. And I, I love books that start that way. And speaking of trial and error, I think a lot of coming, kind of reinventing the way you live, because you come to a point and you go, okay, I can't do that. I know how to do that. Yeah. That muscle's familiar. But I think there's a lot of self-awareness involved in that. So during that moment, during trial and error, it's multiple years. Are you taking notes? Are you going, wow, when I turn the dial this way, whoa, no, that feels like last time. Are you saying, wow, when, you know, I don't like this amount of meetings in the day. Like, tell tell me the process of kind of how you grappled with the self-awareness that allows you to fine tune kind of your scorecard. So all of the above, yes. And it was constant tinkering. I I probably had the system solidified about eight or nine years ago to the point where what you'll recognize and at your best, I was living that probably for the most part of the last decade, but it took years to get there. What it was, and anybody who was really burned out or gone through a period of depression. So I I have lots of friends who have depression. Uh, I do not struggle with that on an ongoing basis. But in the summer of 06, if I had gone to my doctor and said, what is my condition? He would say, you are clinically depressed. Mm-hmm. And I remember how terrible I felt, which is really weird because I'm an optimist. I'm driven. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm all those things. And I remember how horrible I felt. And my counselor said to me one day in a session, he said, Carrie, remember how you feel because you will get out of this, but other people won't. And I never forgot how I felt because the hope was gone. It was like it was sunny out, but it was it was dark inside. Like it's just it, and if you've been there, you understand it. And if you haven't, you you don't get it. But I rem- that was so painful. I was determined to never go back there. And if I got tired for a couple of days, I'm like, whoa, 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 what's going on? What's going on? Take some notes, take some notes, go to sleep, mm-hmm. take some naps. So I just took so many notes, had some really good counseling, like professional coaching along the way. But it wasn't like, you know. I found this website and downloaded the system. It was a whole bunch of trial and error. And so I started to pay attention to time. And the problem with that was I'd I'd done time management for over a decade. And time is a fixed commodity, right? Like you and I get 24 hours in a day. And I was pretty good at time management. And yet I got burned out. So there had to be something else. And that's when I started to pay attention to my energy levels. And when I started to manage my energy levels, that's when I started to see real reward. And then the third thing, the the book sort of in three section was priorities, because you can have this beautiful theory. You ever, let me ask you this, John, you ever have a day with like nothing on the calendar and you're like, I'm going to crush it. I'm just going to crush it. Oh yeah. Particularly think back to when you weren't doing what you're doing now, but you were working at Bose or you were at Ramsey or you were at, you know, Home Depot or wherever else Mm -hmm. you were. Uh, So you're there and you're like, I'm going to crush it. I'm going to get all my goals done. And you get in early 
And by four o'clock in the afternoon, you worked your butt off. You got nothing on your list done, but you worked all day. It's like, what just happened? Yeah, where did that day go? Where did that day go? And so many people live that way. And now, you know, in 06, we didn't have smartphones. I had a BlackBerry, but like it barely found the internet. And, you know, yeah. but now we're accessible 24 seven. So I had to learn how to manage other people's expectations, which, you know, is funny because at that time I was leading maybe three or 4,000 people. Now the content I produce gets accessed about a million and a half times a month. So I don't know how many times more people that is, but let's just say it's a lot. And I got more time than ever before. So I went through all that constant experimentation and just took copious notes. And then about five years ago, I realized when I got that question on a regular basis, I thought, well, maybe I'll do a workshop on this. Like, let's just see if this works for other people. And so over the last five years, I've trained thousands of maybe five, 10,000 leaders in the system. And what I'm learning is, oh, this actually works for other people. This is this is a principal thing. This isn't a weird carry thing that works for me. So that's why I'm so excited about it. Now, when you say energy, why do most people, because I've read the same time management books you've read. Um, I think yeah. there was a period in, well, you know, productive development, personal development, whatever, where the word energy was a weird word and it meant like candles <laughs> and you were going to chant in a drum circle. Here's and my like, Christmas. Ah, exactly. Yeah. Like, so why do, you know, people tend to either miss that energy matters or misunderstand it or how, you know, when you say the word energy, what are you talking about? Yeah, it's a great question. So energy, if you think about it this way, when I was running at 100 miles an hour with my head uh, cut off, you know, hair on fire kind of thing in my mm -hmm. 30s, I was tired all the time. But then I got really rested. On the other side of burnout, I got really rested. But no matter how rested I got, and I think almost everyone can relate to this, I had times in the day where I started to drag and other times where I felt fresh and alive and, and ready to go. And I really started to study what I call energy management because you manage your time. It's like only so many appointments and, you know, so on and so forth. But I noticed that, and, and I've done quite a bit of research on this, and there's brain research now that shows that you really only have three to five peak hours in a day. Like when you're writing a book, John, you know, if there's a deadline, you could probably write for 14 hours. But if you're starting a book, like you probably don't write for 14 hours. No, that sounds know. terrible. It I mean, I want to say I do because then people will be impressed by me. I'll be like, <laughs> I'm like Hemingway. I go sport fishing and then I write for like 22 hours a day in Key West. I have so many cats with weird toes. No, I don't know who I don't. Anyone who says they write 14 hours a day, in my opinion, is a liar. Or, or writes garbage. Yeah, writes or garbage writes. Yeah, I mean. Are you Go a morning ahead. person, afternoon person, evening person? Morning. Like I've, that's yeah, why me. the energy thing is so fascinating because this book says a lot of things. I'm starting to go, wait a second. I think this might be, wait a second. And it codified so many things that I've seen in my own life. And I just thought you, you said before there's, you just recently read a book that you're like, I've waited for 10 years for somebody to write this book. That's how I feel about this one. Awesome. Um, especially around the energy side of it. So three to five hours in a day. Cal Newport would agree. Brain Research would agree. Claire Diaz-Ortiz, who's written on this, she worked at Twitter in the early days. And mm -hmm. she said the best software engineers in the world, and they had them at Twitter in the early days, sure. probably have three good hours of coding in them a day. That's it. And then their brain kind of goes, you know. Yeah. And I found as a writer, as a content creator, even as a podcaster, like I can't do interviews from 8 a.m. until 6 p.m. So I started dividing my day into zones. And I'm a morning person too. You're the 5 a.m. club guy, right? Yeah, I remember yeah. those days, 5 a.m. club. Old school. And um, so I usually am best between about 7 a.m. and 11 a.m. And then I have a little spurt after lunch, particularly if I had a nap, you know, eat and then sleep for 20 minutes. And then, you know, one to two is pretty good. And then I have a, an hour or two a day where I start to really drag my knuckles. And for me, that happens between four and six in the afternoon. And I want you to think of those in terms of color. So when you're at your best, your, your green zone, for you and me, that's the morning. I call a red zone, the time when you're like, please, another cup of coffee. Like, I need something here. I need toothpicks for my eyes. I got to go for a run. I got to do something to stay awake. We all have those. And then everything else is in the middle. You're kind of yellow zone. So green, green zone, red zone, yellow zone. You can divide your workday that way. Now, the mistake most people make is they don't manage their energy 
And so what happens is you have your most productive hours in the day, which in our case is the morning. If you're a night owl, they might happen in the evening. They might happen late afternoon. If you're a midday person, which is actually the majority of people, usually happens between like 10 and 2 or maybe maybe 2 and 4 or something like that where you have your green zone. What you should do is do your most important work in your green zone. So if I'm producing content, what I used to do when I burned out was, so I was a preacher at that time. It's like time to write the message. Every single Sunday, you got a new message to do, but I got a breakfast meeting and then I went for a bike ride and then I got into the office and then I was tired. So then I went to Starbucks and I got a latte and then somebody stopped me. And then it's four o'clock in the afternoon. It's like, oh, I got to start that message and I got to write it. And then it wasn't very good anymore. But the problem is, John, and you and I were talking about this before we hit record, you can wing it. You can yeah. wing it. So I could get up there and I could pretend and do a pretty good job. And most people go, that was good because communication is my gift. Now, what a lot of people do is they don't get that done in their green zone. So they're not producing their best work. They're never developing their gift. They're using it, which is cheating their gift because you use your gift. You never develop it. So you never get better. You just, oh, okay, whoa, I got whoa, the message whoa. So written. you're saying there's a difference between using a gift and developing it. Correct. Oh, so what you yeah. should do in your green zone, not just write that next book, John, yeah. you got to study Hemingway. Yeah. You've got to say, okay, who are the best writers in the world? I'm going to study Stephen King. Oh. I'm going to, so you got your three to five hours in the morning. So you write for two and then you go study the best cross-examination people in legal history. Or then you read uh, some of the great works of the ages. You read some Dickens or you go for a walk and you start thinking about your ideas and you're like, you know what's wrong with that chapter? I'll tell you what's wrong with that chapter. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Because your best ideas never happen when you're at the keyboard. They happen when you're in the park. They happen when you're at lunch. They happen when you're in the shower. So you got to give yourself that margin when you're at your best. So you work for a couple hours. You think through okay, how do I become a better communicator, a better preacher? And you're so good at honing your craft. You do that in your green zone. And if you tackle that during the course of the day, by the time noon rolls around, you could just quit. It's like, I got it done. I got the big stuff done. And the problem with a lot of people is they don't spend their time strategically. They don't think about their energy level. So now I got to get that chapter finished. The, the publisher's breathing down my neck. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. You're tired. You're over caffeinated. Your, your head has already struggled with decision fatigue. You don't get it done. Then you go home. Well, you work from home, but you pop out of your office and you say, Jenny, I'm sorry. I got to work tonight. Kids, sorry. Dad's not available. And he's yeah. grumpy, right? Yeah. Because yeah. Now, now you got to work. And sorry, there goes another Saturday up in flames. So what you do in the at your best framework, the thrive cycle, I call it, is you flip it is you do your most important work, your, the work that you're best at when you're at your best in your green zone. Your yellow zone, you can take some real, I do most of my, I have a podcast with 18 million downloads. I do most of that interviewing in my yellow zone mm -hmm. uh, because I can prep in my green zone, but I can interview in my yellow zone because ah, it doesn't good. require the same level as prep. Yeah. So I don't need to use my green zone interviewing people. Plus it's in the morning. If you're doing West Coast, that doesn't work. Red zone, I do all the little things like fill out that expense report or clear that inbox or catch up on Slack with my team. When that happens, you get almost everything important done and then you can come home with some energy left in the tank. I feel bad. I wish I could get my 30s back, John. Because my kids are grown now. They're in their 20s. When I was in my 30s, I'd leave it all on the field at work. And then I come home and it's like, all right, time to be served. You know, yeah. where's dinner? And I don't want to help with the kids' homework. And, you know, I have a great relationship with my kids, but I've told them I wish I could get those years back because if I knew then what I know now, I would have been a different dad. I would have been a different boss. And I wouldn't have let my stress leak out on all the people close to me. I I love that. And there's three examples from my own life of of ways that I'm adapting based on on the book one i'm starting to reduce breakfast meetings like breakfast yes. is too expensive seven to eight is too expensive some casual like i can't do it like i'll meet you at lunch lunch is yellow cool i'm not i can't give the best most productive hour of my day to like a coffee chit chat second thing is um and everyone who's listening to this has had this experience i don't want to do a 4 p.m on friday meeting like that's for yes. one purpose firing people other than that <laughs> Anytime, any job you work at where a boss is regularly scheduling a 4 p.m. meeting where great work has to get accomplished, no, that's a terrible idea. And the third is if I'm 
I'll write on the way to an event where I'm going to speak because I'm high energy. It's a green zone. I won't write on the way home because it's red. I'm empty. I got oh, nothing. And so I'll stop. And so for me, I think that when people read the book, they'll go, okay, here's how I can see this in my own life. But I'm curious. I think that there's going to be a lot of people that go, that sounds amazing, but I were, you know, you guys are both really handsome entrepreneurs, super tall um, boat owners. Yes. Carrie has a boat. I, I have a bunch of Lego sets. You have um, a kayak. I have a kayak. I have four kayaks. That's true. I'm kayaks. so rich that in beats kayak. one boat. Yeah, I could tie those together. A lot of people wouldn't judge that. But I think there's going to be people that go, okay, hey, I work at a corporation. How do I tell people no? Or how do I start to set boundaries? Because you touch on that. Because I yeah. think there is, yeah. there's an inherent guilt and, and it might be your background. It might be your people pleaser or whatever. But anytime you say like, oh, you know what? I'm, I'd love to see you at lunch. I don't have any time in the morning. Like you start mm. to feel, like, oh, must be nice. Like you don't, like, how do I, if I'm inside a corporation, I work for a 50 person team, a thousand person team. And I realize yeah. I really agree with what Carrie's saying. How do I start to tell people no? Like, so I did work at a law firm. Nope. I did work at a law firm where I was bottom of the totem pole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I, I didn't have these principles, but I actually operated in a very similar way until I became the boss and then it all went out the window. Uh, so I, I can understand and empathize. So let's do a little bit of math and then get specifically to the question. So a lot of time, we feel like life is out of control. And when that happens, we focus on what we can't control, not on what we can. So 168 hours in a week, 40 hours of work. Let's say some are working 50 or 60, some are working 30, but let's just pick 40 as a nice round number. So think about that. 168 hours minus 40 equals you have full control over 128 hours of your week, which is an awful lot for you side hustlers. Anybody who's got something going on, that is a lot of time. And you're yeah. like, well, I got kids soccer and then we got dance lessons and then we got family things and we're seeing friends. It's like, whoa, whoa, that's all a choice. Like you choose when you go to bed, you choose when you wake up, you choose how many activities you roll in, but you have control over 128 hours. But let's well, you choose how many activities work. your kids do too. Like, let's you be do. clear about that. Like, we have a kid heavy activity culture where it's like, okay, they're going to do 400 hours of activity. Like, no one's making you. Like, the government isn't like, I'm sorry, your kid has to be in seven sports. Like, we do have choice. I love the idea. I just want to pause on that. Don't focus on what you can't control. Focus on what you can. And yeah. chances are, if you're honest, it's more than you think. It's not everything by any means. Right. Um, we've all come through a year where we didn't control, but I, I love that. Okay, so I start okay. to look at what I can't so control. So now you can control that. Now let's break down the work week. 40-hour work week in mm -hmm. a corporate culture. Everyone's sitting in cubicles. Nobody has any freedom. You can't work from a coffee shop. Can't work from home. Let's just mm -hmm. pick that scenario. Because I've taught this to thousands of leaders, and I get a lot of feedback. So I'll walk you through what I've learned. Now, if you work at a coffee shop, you're slinging macchiatos all day. Yeah. Okay, you're making cold brews all day. You got no choice. But if you're in a knowledge environment, an office environment, I've asked those workers, those leaders, I'm like, okay, um, how many committed hours do you have where your boss says, Tuesday, 10 a.m., in this room with me? What percentage is that? Yeah. yeah. Any guess what the average answer is? I'm sure people think it's huge and it's like, like five hours a week or something absurdly low. Yes, you're exactly right. Because people think I have no control. Yeah. I did this question uh, this week with a leader. He said five and same thing. He's like, crap, only five. Yeah. And then the average high mark is 10 to 12. Teaching this to thousands of leaders, I've never heard one middle manager who said more than 12 hours. Yeah. But I'm going to be generous because there's that one listener to your many listeners who says, Carrie, I have 20. Half of my time is yeah. gone at work. Okay. For that one of you who has 20 hours a week, let's do the math. 88% of your time is free. 12% yeah. is spoken for. That's it. And all of a sudden that becomes very liberating. So suddenly, and you know this, John, you could show up in your office at 7 a.m. and your boss is not going to complain. Mm -hmm. you, could, you could stay late your boss is probably not going to complain. So I would look at all those free zones in your work and say, now I got to figure out, and I've got a formula for this in the book. I got to figure out what I'm best at because I got 10 things on my list of things I'm responsible for. These three I hate. These two I love. 
And these really matter. If you can find what you love and what really matters, like my boss loves it when we crush the sales goal, right? My boss loves it when I produce a really clean report on the financials. My company needs me to really build into my sales team, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. Figure out what that is. And if you love it, that's even better. Do that in your green zone. Then if you need more leverage, this is what I would suggest. You go to your boss and you say, hey, I've been reading this book or I listened to this podcast and I really want to produce more for the company. To do it, I'm realizing that my best hours and productivity are happening during this meeting or that meeting. And I'm wondering if it's possible if we could move that weekly meeting or I'm wondering if it's possible if I could come in earlier or stay later or whatever your case is. And we'll do it for two months. This is my proposal. You get to evaluate the results. If you don't like it, we'll go back to the way it was. If you like it, then I want to do more of that. Unless your boss is insane, most reasonable bosses are going to say, absolutely, I'm in. And if you demonstrate that you can do it, you've, you've got progress. I think the challenge for some people, myself included, is that when you say something like, you don't understand my schedule, I can't possibly do that. I'm in that phase right now. My I'm, my wife has said, you know, I tend to be a workaholic. I love what I do. I always tell people, yeah. if you hate what you do, you try to do it less. If you love what you do, you'll become a workaholic because you want to do it more. Yeah. And so yeah. when she said, hey, at four o'clock or it's the summer, let's take Fridays off. And I come up with a bunch of excuses. I haven't done the work to see if it's actually true. So mm -hmm. my boss wants me there 20 hours. I, my hands are tied where with a little effort, with a little exploration, I would find out, oh, wait, I'm. I'm saying things that aren't true. And I think what's scary for some people is you lose your excuses. So mm. it's easy for me to say, Carrie, I'd love to do this, but hey, there's all these outside controls. And you go, well, can we look at the outside controls? And then all of a sudden, what you thought was a 40-hour commitment to a boss who you've described as an ogre is a five-hour commitment to a boss who would be really excited if you presented something that made you more productive. As I relinquish excuses, how do you walk somebody through that? Because that's the scary part. Sometimes, I, I, the, the last thing I'd say about that is when people want to lose weight and I say, oh, it's easy, um, or it's simple, it's not easy, but it's simple, eat less, move more. They go, no, 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 I want a complicated solution because we want complicated <laughs> solutions because then we can blame the solution and say, I would have done it, but it's too complicated. How do you help people release their excuses about their time management, their energy management? Well, one thing is to get brutally honest with yourself. So in my section on time, because there's a million time management books out there and I'm not going to compete in that space, I do want to take away people's excuses. And I was the king of excuse makers because in my 30s, when things were going you know, like crazy, a lot smaller than they are now, but they were going like crazy, I would say things like, John, I don't have the time for that. Or, uh, sorry, I can't do that. Or I wasn't able to finish the report. I apologize, right? So you're really sorry, but there's all this stuff. And then, then I was reading this book about the president of the United States and how the president spends his time. And I had this epiphany where I thought, gosh, I feel so overwhelmed right now. This is before I burned out. If I became the president of the United States, or in my case, the prime minister of Canada, mm -hmm. and I had to like run the free world, I'd be a disaster. It's like the headlines would be, man cannot decide what to eat for breakfast, whole universe destroyed, right? Like yeah, that would yeah. be awful. I, I, I just couldn't do it. And I'm like, the people I admire most and the people with the most responsibility in the world have the same amount of time as me. And so I made a resolution that I would stop saying, I don't have the time. And I would start saying, I didn't make it. So when you're home late again, this is what you have to say to Jenny. Jenny, I didn't make the time for a date night. Jenny, mm -hmm. I didn't make the time for kayaking with the kids. Mom, I didn't make the time to call you. Now, you're not going to say that out loud if you want to stay married or sure. you know, have friends. But if you start that as an internal dialogue, when you have to tell your boss, I didn't get the report done. It was my fault. My bad. I didn't allocate the right amount of time. Or traffic is an excuse. Sorry, I was late. Traffic was bad. Yeah. Right. Sunday morning at 3 a.m. it was bad. Like, this is what you're telling me? Like, come on, come on. Like, give me a break, yeah. right? There was no traffic. I, I took the same route. Oh, you should have left 20 minutes earlier. When you eliminate that internal dialogue, the second thing I would say is, what are you running from? There was a time where in my 30s, and I'm in my 50s now, but in my 30s, when I stayed too late at the office, things were chaotic at home. And I didn't really want to go home. Oh, yeah, sure. 
it's just easier to keep the laptop open. It's just easier to say, I got to answer a bunch of email. And like, now I, I want to hurry home. I want to be home with the people yeah. I love. I want to be there for my friends and I want to be fully present. Yeah. Toddlers are uh, harder than an inbox. Like, uh, <laughs> like that's just, I don't know who said it. I guess I said that. The, the other thing I would say too, John, just to be fair to people, because that was a bit of tough talk, is if you are unaware of your zones in the day, like I consulted with this very large organization, they had 80, 100 staff, and nobody would say it out loud, but they all hated their leadership team meeting. So once a week, they would have a strategic, you know, their executive leadership team would meet, and no one found that meeting energized. So when I taught this material a couple of years ago in beta form, they went through their zones and they compared their charts. Everyone was in their red or yellow zone when they were holding the meeting. So what they did is they moved it a couple hours to when people were in their green or yellow zones. Now everybody loves that meeting and they solved it. So often the things that you dread and the things are you, that you hate are, are, have nothing to do with whether they're good or bad because you probably love your family. You probably love taking time off. But if you're dragging your knuckles all day and you're just tired, you're going to hate that stuff. Like kayaking when you have energy or kayaking when you're exhausted, two different experiences. I've done oh, yeah. them both times. And getting this stuff right. And like you say, protecting your green zone. There's a whole chapter in the book about protecting your green zone from people, from distractions, from interruptions. If you can do that and you get your favorite and most important stuff done during your green zone, it, it's a game changer. And if that's all you pull away from it, there's a lot more that will make a quantitative difference. Oh, and people will notice a difference. That's what I, I mean, my version of that was when I had a day job, a corporate job, and I got up early to write the stuff I wanted to write that was on the side of that, I was a nicer person the rest of the day because I wasn't going to work saying, this should be where I get to write creative ideas about things I want because that's not what they hired me for. If I mm. wanted that time, if I do that at 5 a.m., if I get up and do it, then the rest of the day, I didn't try to force that to be something it wasn't going to be. I was actually present. I could actually do my job with excellence because I slingshotted myself into the rest of the day with some greens on time in the morning. There's another principle David Allen writes about in getting things done that's so helpful. He calls them open loops. So I found out um, today, actually, that Forbes wants me to write an article and do a webinar, which is really exciting. That's and awesome. To do it. But I looked at my Asana, which is our project management thing, and I saw it was due tomorrow. And I called my assistant. I'm like, what's up? And she goes, oh, I just put that on the calendar so you'd see it. But I had this like panic moment because mm -hmm. I had interviews all day today. I got stuff to do tomorrow. And I'm like, how am I going to get that done? So in a few hours, I'm going for dinner with my family. What happens when you have unresolved things like I really want to do creative writing. I really got to get to this or I didn't get my message done or that report done or whatever it happens to be is even though when you can't work on it, you're thinking about it. Even at the subconscious level, you're thinking about it and you worry about it and you don't sleep at night. You wake up at 3 a.m. and you're like, oh, I got to get that done or I really hate my job because I want to finish this. If you get that done in your green zone, and it's best if it's early in the morning, it's fine if it's not. But if you get that done, you close that loop and you don't worry about it anymore. You don't think about it. And even if you can't finish it in one zone, you're like, I have so much progress on this chapter of soundtracks. I can go and relax tonight and go to the kids' school and watch them play in the marching band and not be worried about, I haven't got that chapter done. I haven't got that chapter done. And I think when you remove the intellectual weight, the, the heaviness of all that stuff undone and a crushing to-do list when you recalibrate your life on these principles, you will get freedom of mind as well as freedom of time. I love that. Freedom of mind as well as freedom of time. You mentioned the word distractions a minute ago hmm. um, and protecting green zone. One of the things I like to say is that goals are hard because Netflix is easy. Yeah. It seems like our distractions get smarter and smarter and smarter at distracting us every year. We never talk about that, but hmm. in the 1980s, there weren't teams of software developers whose goal was to get my time. There just weren't. There weren't, you know, whole companies whose goal was to get me to spend more time doing something that had nothing to do with something that I was trying to do. But there are now. That's the world we live in. And it's going to continue to be the world we live in. How can we be deliberate about dealing with our distractions? So a couple of different ways. There are multiple distractions. People, yourself, and then um, technology. So mm -hmm. a simple thing for technology, most of your listeners have heard this a thousand times. But if you haven't done it, do it. Turn off all notifications on your phone. 
and all your devices. You don't need to be pinged every time there's an email, a like on social, or every time someone texts you. And there's this, this fear, like this panic of almost like, I can't be without my phone for an hour. You can be. You really can be. And if you're going to do deep work, there are brain studies that show if you get a single ping. So let's let's say you text me. I'm in my green zone. I'm working on an article for Forbes, John. And you text me, Carrie, you still good for three o'clock this afternoon for our podcast? I'm like, yeah, John, all good. I'm back at it. How long does it take me to refocus? Isn't it like 15 minutes or something crazy? Yeah, it's about 25. 25, 25 minutes. 25 minutes, 25 minutes to refocus. I'm so sorry and I texted you, Carrie. We have all been. No, I wouldn't see it until I want to see it. Yeah, that's the fun part, right? Like if the notifications are off, I don't know that John texted me and you can program your phone. So the most important people, I think you are, uh, you actually are on my favorite list, just so you know where you stand. In oh, good, life. good. You're on my favorites list. But if you like, I got to talk to Carrie. If you called me, it would ring through. So I have 20 people on my favorites list. Most of them are not the kind of people who call me annoyingly at random yeah, times. They wouldn't of the be day. on the favor list. They're not yeah, calling. But yeah. if my son calls me, he's going to get through. Totally. But it happens once a month. Big yeah. deal. And if it's really an emergency, trust me, you're not that important, okay? But if it really is an emergency, the police will come to your door or the <laughs> yeah. firefighters will knock and they will let you yeah. know you need to evacuate your house. Other than that, you can do three to five hours totally undistracted. And I have friends now who just don't even let their phones wake up until 11 a.m. Yep. And it's like, I'm just going to go without technology and my laptop is programmed. So that's huge. Second thing is people. And what you have to do is train people not to interrupt you. There are different strategies. Uh, if you're in an office, if you're in that cubicle environment, you can have this discussion with your coworkers. Near AL says some people put traffic cones on their desk or, mm -hmm. hey, you, if, if it's a company-wide thing you do and you do this as a team study, you can just have a little like green symbol on your desk that says, I'm in my green zone. Or you can say, hey, uh, free at 11 a.m. or whatever that happens to be. Mm -hmm. And then people respect that over time. Another thing that works really well, you and I are both wearing them right now, headphones. They're like people canceling devices, right? So if you got <laughs> your so headphones funny. on, <laughs> they're not noise canceling, they're people canceling. Yeah. And so now you can just like focus on your desk. You, you can have nothing on. Like if you can't work to music, don't worry about it. Headphones are a signal that you're busy when your head's down. So, so you can true. do things like that. And then the final thing is you have to have some self-discipline because I am perfectly capable of distracting myself when I have nobody else distracting me. I can go in the name of research to Google and soon I'm in a YouTube wormhole that I don't get out of for 45 minutes. And I went to all the suggested videos. So that's a bit of self-discipline. The other thing I would say is pick your ideal work environment. John, you've spent a lot of time curating that office. This is my office here that I'm recording from. And you got to train yourself to work in airports and hotel lobbies and you know Ubers mm -hmm. and things like that. But you probably can find if you work from home, which the majority of people do now, at least part time, spend the money to get an environment you like to work in. So mine's pretty simple. We did it for a few thousand dollars five years ago. I haven't changed it much, but it's, it's beautiful. And I enjoy coming to work here. And uh, in the summer, I work on my back porch. And I'm like, when I'm on my back porch, I'm in my productivity zone. So you can do things like that that can really help you focus. There's uh, a full chat. It's the longest chapter in the book on people because people are your biggest distraction. All kinds of strategies there on how to deal with people who want to get in your face. Because here's the thing. Nobody will ever ask you to accomplish your most important priorities. They will only ask you to accomplish theirs. Ah, uh, that's good. They, they'll never interrupt you and go, I just want to make sure you're doing the things that matter most at the time that matters most. That's not, exactly. That, that's I'm like, John, sentence. can you, John? And I do the same thing. Sure. You're not bad people. Sure. Every time I talk to you, I've got something I want you to do. At least listen to me. Mm -hmm. And so um, you just have to realize that if you don't make time for the things that matter most, nobody else will. And the people who pay the price for that are always, never the people at work, it's the people closest to you. Yeah, and I, my, the phrase I say with that is that I want my family to get the best of me, not the rest of me. Like, totally. and a lot of times it was rest. I've got so many questions because I love this book. I know we're we're coming towards the end of our conversation, but I want to jump back to burnout for a second. I think yeah. people think of burnout as it was a single moment, maybe everything fell apart, but I think equally as dangerous is a slow, continuous burnout you never notice. Like there's never mm. a singular event that's loud enough to snap you out. 
It's just you don't live up to your best. If you had to say to somebody, okay, somebody came to you and said, Carrie, I feel like I might be in burnout. I'm not, I'm not living up to my full potential. What would you tell somebody that's not living up to their full potential or feels that way? Yeah. John, you made the introduction to the book, as you probably noticed, because you asked me a really good question, which is, is you asked me this years ago. You said, is burnout inevitable? Is just this just a rite of passage mm-hmm. that everybody has to go through? And my answer now is, I didn't have an answer for you then, is no. Um, actually, it's not. But I think a lot of people are in burnout. So I gave you the story that I had. If burnout is a scale of one to 10, I was at a nine in 2006. Like it was my life stopped, you know, I didn't declare a finish line. So my body did. It's like, we're not doing this anymore. Yeah, this ain't it. So I had that, but there has this thing, it's not a medical diagnosis, but I'll call it low grade burnout. And low grade burnout, I define as the functions of life continue, but the joy of life is gone. Oh, that's great. Say that again. Yeah. The functions of life continue, but the joy of life is gone. So you're getting up, you're going to work, you're going to the ball game, you're there with dinner, but like it's not fun anymore. And some of the signs of burnout, your passion is fading. Um, you don't feel the highs and lows anymore. Like life is supposed to be like, I should be excited that I'm talking to John Acuff, which actually today I am. But when, I, when I'm somewhat burned out or really burned out, I'm like, oh, one more meeting. It's John. At least he's a good guy. Yeah. But everything is in black and white. Everything is just monotone. And or your reactions, your emotions are disproportionate. So in other words, you're not feeling much, but all of a sudden, you know, Ellie doesn't empty the dishwasher and you're like, I can't believe you didn't empty the dishwasher. What did you do? And blah, 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 blah. You treat a three out of 10 like it's a 12 out of 10. Or Uh, conversely, you hear that so-and-so got a cancer diagnosis and you're like, oh, yeah. (laughs) On the inside, you're, oh, yeah. Like on the outside, you're like, oh, that's too bad. But you're like totally faking it. Yeah. And you're good at it because you're an adult and you figured out how to do that. And uh, you don't laugh anymore. Like you're watching Netflix or Comedy Central, but you're not laughing. Uh, another one is that you're self-medicating, which can be yeah, obviously drugs, alcohol, but it can be overworking. It's just the very thing that's killing me is what I keep going back to. We have this free burnout assessment people can take. I'll give you the website in a minute if you're interested. We've run thousands of people through it. And I think, you know, because it's life and it's hard, you're always going to have two or three of the signs of burnout with you. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, this isn't quite working right. That isn't quite working right. A lot of people are in what I call mid-grade burnout, which is the functions of life continue, but the joy of life is gone. I've had so many emails, so many conversations, so many one-on-ones with people saying, I didn't think I was burned out. I guess I am. But you look at the research. Over 80% of the population now says they've experienced some signs of burnout over the last year. And we're still, you know, recovering from whatever we're recovering from as a culture right now. And what I think you can do, I would say right now I'm a one out of 10 or two out of 10, you know, in the middle of book book launch season. So that's not terribly bad. But I would like to see people move to almost no symptoms. And I think it's possible because the bottom line of the book is I want to help people live in a way today that will help them thrive tomorrow. And most people live in a way today that will help them struggle tomorrow. In other words, the choices I made today are going to make tomorrow more difficult. Oh, that's great. That's great. Carrie, this has been fantastic. I only have three questions left. Great. I'll go through them fairly quickly. Number one, you and I talk usually about once a month. You're 10 years ahead of me career-wise, life-wise. Yeah. Um, and so I loved getting to ask you questions about, okay, well, hey, here's this thing I'm working on. Who's somebody that's 10 years ahead, 20 years ahead that you look to for guidance, advice, mentorship? Like who's in your 10 years, 20 years ahead category? Yeah, Andy Stanley has been a huge mm-hmm. influence in my life. A lot of leaders know him, uh, look to him. There's a guy in New England named Gordon McDonald. He wrote a mm-hmm. book years ago, decades ago, called Ordering Your Private oh, World. Love that book. Oh, my picture. Gordon and I talk on a regular basis. My my picture of my life at 80, if I live that long, is I'd love to be Gordon. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Second question, um, you, you are in Canada. Um, you're from Canada. Can you please stop with the geese? Um, yes. I feel like every well, we year. We keep exporting them. We don't like them either. Yeah, I just feel like every year I'm like, they got out again, guys. Like, if you could come, you know, get Justin Trudeau or whoever. I don't know who's running the show up there, but like uh, the geese are an issue. either. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. we just keep sending them to Nashville, you know? Yeah, I feel like there's a the lot A-Cups of... live at, go, go yeah. visit. Yeah, it's like a lot yeah. of hipster musical geese coming down. <laughs> um, third, 
Third and final question, where can people follow up with you? Um, you mentioned the yeah. assessment. I think that sounds amazing. We've talked about that offline too. So book, you have a mm. gigantic podcast. You can tell how much I loved your book because I didn't even get a chance to ask questions about your podcast. You've got a gigantic podcast. You've encouraged me with mine. All the things. Where can people get all things Carrie Newhoff? All the things, CarrieNewhoff.com. If you misspell it, Google will redirect you because it's such a weird name. Yeah. Um, but anyway, and for the book, including a free assessment, we also have, if you order uh, before release date, you'll get access to a masterclass. It'll be a four fee after the book, but it's free right now if you pre-order the book. You can get it at atyourbesttoday.com. So remember the today part, at your best today, because if you go to atyourbest.com, you'll end up like learning how to do carpentry. But atyourbesttoday.com mm -hmm. gets you access to all the bonuses. My team and I have done that. It'll get you the burnout assessment, get a free Thrive calendar, and the masterclass will walk you through the ideas of the book before you get the book. So you can start today. And it's, it's a great class. I think, I think sometimes um, we have a really <laughs> smart, um, attractive audience. And I think when yeah. they hear free bonuses with books, they're like, what is oh, that? Yeah. Like, it's going to be, be a phone. sticker. No, the master yeah. class is beautiful. It's They invested a ton of money, a ton of time into this. So when yes. you hear freebie, I don't want you to think traditional freebie because sometimes when people launch books, they go, I'm giving away 40,000 worth of... No, you're not. You're <laughs> no. not. Stop. I saw somebody no. say, this is a $30,000 value. And I was like, no, it's not. So please no. hear me say, this masterclass, the stuff Carrie's talking about are amazing. Okay, so that covers that. Podcast, hit me up with that. Yeah, just Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast. If you search my name and John's name, you'll find it on the Googles because you've been on multiple times. Yeah, you so, can start with our episode. There's been a ton of really awesome leaders on there. Yeah, we've had Simon Sinek, Adam Grant, uh, Amy Edmondson. Just interviewed Amy Porterfield the other day. Oh, nice. Got, yeah, Amy's awesome. Nice. Well, and then the social Amy's. media, you're everywhere. It's all Carrie yeah, Newhoff. Yeah, you should be able to get much. that name, right? There's no, you don't have to be Carrie Newhoff. Yeah, music. not a whole lot of other Carrie Newhoffs <laughs> yeah. like arguing for it, particularly yeah. guys named Carrie Newhoff. There's just not a whole Dude, lot. Dude, it's just it. you. Like, I'm out here. I mean, Acuff's pretty good, but occasionally I'm like, I'm going to have to, like, on Facebook, I'm author John Acuff. That's him. Hmm. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to have to put an extra <laughs> name. I mean, I'm not proud of that. You just get to be. I wasn't real thrilled with my name as a kid, but it turned out to be a really big advantage in the end. So thanks, mom and dad. Yeah, it's like they knew. It's like your dad. It was like, someday when you have a personal brand and there's a thing called Instagram. Newhoff's hard. N-I-E-U-W-H-O-F. So let's give them a really complicated first. I name. Google your name occasionally. There's still times yeah. where I'm like, uh, let me Google that real quick. How do we get this right? It takes yeah. the staff on average a month to learn how to spell my name. Ah, so, that's good. That's these when, are adults. That's when you know they're in. So, Carrie, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me. This was a blast. It has been. Everybody, go out and check out the book. It's called At Your Best. It's by Carrie Newhoff. Carrie, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, John. Thank you for listening to my interview with Carrie Newhoff today. We'll put all the links in the show notes as always. I hope you love that as much as I did. And thank you for reviewing my podcast. When your podcast is newish, like I think I should say newish, hasn't been around for a year, that's still newish. When it's newish like mine, the reviews are super important. So make sure you subscribe or follow or whatever it is the kids with their TikTok and their hip hop are saying these days. And please write a review. Last but not least, big thank you once again to our sponsor, Remodel Health. Visit remodelhealth.com slash analysis today to learn more about the health benefits analysis and get your personalized evaluation. That's it for this week. I'll see you next Monday. And remember, all it takes is a goal. Thanks for listening. To learn more about the All It Takes is a Goal podcast and to get access to today's show notes, transcript, and exclusive content from John Acuff, visit acuff.me slash podcast. Thanks again for joining us. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the All It Takes is a Goal podcast. <laughs>